was one time in the kitchen that uh, he also he pounced on me and of course I punched him and uh, we kicked around and there was a fire extinguisher in front of me looking back maybe it was a call for help I wish I was wishing that someone will get me out of this situation I really didn't want to go for help someone to take me out because then I will lose him mm. but I was kind of maybe subconsciously yelling out in total different ways that somebody should come save me I took the fire extinguisher I didn't spray him I sprayed the entire kitchen the stoves and as long as the squeezes the three or four squeezes is I just went around maybe tomorrow there's going to be an investigation welcome back to another episode of inspiration for the nation and this episode is a very powerful very painful episode to listen to and I just need to give you a trigger warning before we talk about very, very heavy topics. We talk about suicide, we talk about abuse in every sense of the word, and this episode may not be for people that are too young. But if you choose to watch this episode, I specifically ask you to watch the entire episode or to listen to the entire episode because Penny's Penny's journey is is one filled with a lot of challenges, but at the end of the day, his message for hope is very important. And, and I don't want you to, to listen to the first 15, 20 minutes and get so sad and so discouraged. This this conversation is, is talking about how Penny was abused by someone he trusted and him trying to escape that relationship and how did he come to forgive those that hurt him and and how did he move on with his life this episode is in memory of shem david ben yaakov Shlema, as well as miriam sarah bas yaakov moshe you'll hear about the incredible platform called ok clarity that you probably have been following their whatsapp statuses and their instagram but um if you haven't heard of them yet you're going to hear so much about them and how it ties into this episode you're also going to hear about an incredible book that just came out called The Daily Aliyah. It is fantastic. You'll also hear about my favorite clothing brand called Twillery, which I'm wearing right now. It's going to be more of the light part of the episode. And you'll also hear about Dr. Shlomi Zimmerman's book. And he's actually the person who recommended Penny to be a guest on this show after they were together by a Kef Shonashi event. Here we go. I'm Yaakov Langer, and you're listening to Inspiration for the Nation. Okay, Penny Tao, thank you so much for coming in. You drove in from Muncie. Staten Island. Staten Island. Staten Island. Okay, not as bad as Muncie. Not as bad, but it took you a while to get here? Uh, yeah, it took me longer than it, got, it gets me to Mon Muncie. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry about that. But you're here, and um, thank you for, for doing this. I can imagine it's... You, even though I, I know you've spoken about this a bunch, I'm sure it's each time some form of difficulty to bring it up again. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, first, thank you f very much for having me. Sure. Uh, yes, it, it is a difficult topic. and uh, But uh, right now, I feel like it's a mission. I've told my story numerous times, and uh, I'm really not interested in repeating my story and telling my story again, but I feel it's very, very important. This is a topic that needs to be, you know, as much exposure as possible. So it's not really my story. Uh, yes, the details are mine, but this is a story of many, many, and many in silence. So take me back to, let's start off with your mother getting sick. How old were you, and how did that affect your family uh we're a family of nine we have seven girls two boys uh, my mother was diagnosed when i was around 10 i didn't know she had cancer um until the end uh, i knew many people not many but i knew a few people who had cancer but i was never told she had cancer but i did know that she had real uh, serious health issues because she was in the hospital a lot. She passed away right before my bar mitzvah. Mm. I was sent to yeshiva in Bar Park. Um, the yeshiva is a great yeshiva. I have nothing bad to say. I have only good memories over there from that yeshiva. Only good memories, except one giant one. Mm. But uh, yeah, and over there, there was uh, one Rebbe who was, um, he was the most successful Rebbe. 
because he was uh, kind of a Rebbe Mashgiach and a Mashpia. Um, so he used to, he looked out for the vulnerable kids and used to talk a lot, spend a lot of time with them. And I guess I was the biggest target, I was the easiest one. Uh, I was young, I was cute, I was very little, a very little boy. <laughs> um, I was shorter than most of the kids. Uh, Yusim, there's an extra kind to Yusim no matter how. Right. Um, so uh, right away, as soon as I went into yeshiva, he right away told me that uh, anything, I can talk to him uh, anytime. But he knows, just like any good people, I'm not saying bad people, uh, good people usually they can feel that. Somebody who has uh, compassion, he has no compassion. From very early on, when I was there, he picked up right away my rift with my father. And uh, he took advantage of that and I didn't notice it. Uh, meaning he told me stories of my father when he was a bocha. And we're coming from totally different places. Um, he knew nothing about my father. And some of it was good to believe it happens to be, and I wanted to believe it. Hmm. So and there was a lot of things. He always gave me the right, whether it was I was right or not. And even if I was right uh, with something, you know, uh, there is a way. Usually a, a rabbi has a responsibility, a counselor, a teacher, a, a therapist, uh, whoever it is. Um, a responsible adult has a responsibility to smooth out even even a dysfunctional family and our family wasn't dysfunction by any mean um, even a dysfunctional family you don't just rip away the kid unless if it's for safety reasons you know you try to smooth things out you know your mother is not that crazy your father is not that crazy you can work together yeah they have issues or whatever whatever it is so it wasn't it was totally the opposite over here my father's at fault he doesn't mean your goods you know it comes from anger it's not so much from stress it's anger it's uh, whatever and when i came back sometimes if uh, my sister said something or uh, whatever is it's kind of a, it wasn't those words outright that they hate you mm -hmm. but whatever it was is basically it was driving a rift i mean i clearly understand uh, understood from him that um they almost regret that I'm around. It, he, so he, he basically like, I guess, groomed you to, to make you feel worthless when it came to your family? I appreciate you uh, you uh, brought up that word, uh, word, grooming, because that's exactly what he did. And almost in all abuse cases, and I want to bring that up, I heard it from uh, others that you had before, uh, mental health professionals. Um, first, um, 80 upwards, even more than 80% is people that you know. Mm. It's not strangers that pull you into a driveway, you know, in the dark of the night. It's people that you know. So they don't just grab you and abuse you. They groom you. Mm. They take you in, into their uh, world, whatever, whatever the grooming is. Everybody, everybody. It's like basically they build some form of trust mentally or some type of control, I would use even like mentally. So you're... It's probably both. Mm -hmm. It's a trust and control. Mm. Yeah. So this is exactly what happened over here. And uh, yeah, and I felt it that way that he was really the only person in the world who understands where I am, what I'm struggling with. And he was my uh, backbone. So um, a month and a half in, probably, um, I would say even a month and we started going out. I mean, he used to take me out of yeshiva um, with his car. And then he took me home. He had a computer and this is Baruch Park, hmm. Hasidim. And he is ultra Hasidish. He has, uh, you know, the Walt Hauskot and, you know, Hasnish size. Um, a computer in the house that was non-existent <laughs> almost today the hide would be it's still non-existent but behind the curtain there still <laughs> is the most houses but but then it was really really non-existent so for me it was the greatest thing i mean i found <laughs> i found the greatest river that uh, that can be he taught me to smoke yeah, another big deal you know 14 year old kid you know i don't have to go hide and uh um, it's more than that. He actually bought me cigarettes, so I never lacked. It's not when I was with him and he gave me a cigarette. 
it's actually in the beginning it was like that but after a week or two or three you know he bought me all i always had a box of cigarettes uh, from him um anyway like uh, a month and a half let's say two months even uh into this uh, going back and forth um when i was in his house uh um we were talking the way exactly how it was we're both standing and he smoked in his house and we're both smoking and just schmoozing and he walked by me and he touched me inappropriately basically his hand uh, touched me inappropriately and i right away uh, protested i thought i have like pushed him away uh, like, uh, that's not uh... at first i didn't even verbalize it but i pushed him away mm-hmm. because i was totally shocked um but it happened again like a minute later and that's when i told him uh, i don't know what you're trying to do i was very open with him so it was kind of in a friendly way but i protested and i was never educated about good touch bad touch bad touch and i never heard of such a thing as bad touch and it didn't even cross my mind um i'm gonna say about exploring kids exploring or something else adult child i mean it didn't even cross my mind to even have to watch for something mm-hmm. um regrettably regrettably I was even I wasn't even taught about stranger danger which uh, I think it's a big mistake stranger danger I mean you should teach stranger danger but stranger danger is so remote it's so so remote mm. but I wasn't even taught that uh, anyway so um he apologized he apologized right away um he didn't mean it and whatever but the next day he actually apologized um that it can happen yes he has an affection for me and it can happen and he understood it makes sense makes total sense and uh, we moved on like uh, normal. A month later, that's when um, something crazy happened and that's totally out of the norm. Um, I was in the same spot, standing uh, to describe it. I don't know if you can see it on camera. There's a door behind it. Uh, I was like right next to the door, living room behind it. Um, That was his study room, front room. I was standing over there and uh, um the conversation was so random had nothing to do there was nothing even like um building up to it Mm. all of a sudden he just grabbed me with both hands picked me up almost off my feet it wasn't exactly off my feet but they picked me up and pushed me like fly like in in a rage like someone will watch someone coming with a knife and protecting uh, their daughter running in you know like in a football game that's exactly how he picked me up and he's also a very short skinny person always probably 130 pounds so he did a job like of a six foot seven (laughs) you know 350 pound uh person pushed me onto the couch and um over there right away there wasn't even time to think what kind of trouble i'm getting into but he right away started pulling up my clothing, uh, my pants and uh, whatever. I started yelling and punching and I tried to do damage. Um, it was a long struggle. And um, um, I am not going to get into details uh, this part. It was uh, all I can say. It was very, very graphic and very, very violent. It was very, very violent. Um, it took a couple of minutes. I don't know how long because uh, it, look, it looked like for forever. But I ran out of there. I just when I got f- when I got free, I just um, I ran out and I ran right away to the Wednesday bus and I ran home and I, I can't imagine. I wear a long coat, which is a good thing um, because my pants was torn. Um, I was bloody. I was uh, totally disheveled, and uh, it was the middle of the day. It was still uh, probably early afternoon, and uh, where do I go from there? I'm 14. There's enough tension at home. Um, this is something that I can't even tell anyone. Um, it's something that doesn't even make sense. This is a. Uh, it's not something that happened before, and now it happened to me. This is something that doesn't didn't happen to anyone. So I just roamed the street. I just I walked down. It was uh, mostly on White Avenue because then it was the outskirts of Winswick. I was afraid to go well, around Winswick was very dangerous. So it was kind of like the border of Winswick. I basically walked back and forth, back and forth, uh, the blocks over there until uh, the evening. 
Um, the next day, I was, I couldn't go to yeshiva the next day. Um, I had a very, very, very visible choke mark and I had fist marks on my face. So I just, I looked, I looked to me, I didn't look like a victim because I, I couldn't place victim. Mm. I couldn't place the word victim, didn't understand that. So I didn't even feel I'll get compassion. Just something crazy happened. And I looked very, I, I felt like I looked rather like a drunk or a homeless person um, that got into trouble in a fight, in a crazy fight. And I'm not a fighter. I was never a fighter. Um, anyway, but the following day, I went back to Yeshiva. And uh, he called me right away. I mean, at first he pointed out, you know, uh, come over. And I didn't want to go over. So he sent other friends, you know, to call me into the office. I just refused to go. I just, I couldn't face him. And I, I still, I didn't process it. And I couldn't process it. I was going through something. And I can't even now say exactly what I felt and how I felt. But I, I did not want to see him. Um, anyway, after two, three days, and it was a roller coaster. It was really, really an emotional roller coaster because I really needed to talk to someone. Right. And I had no one. I had no one. I had a whole bunch of sisters. And now I know they're always loving. And believe me, going even back then, there was not a single thing that I can point to even my father that there was a, 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 even a yoda of hate or a yoda of regret or a yoda of any any uh but i truly believed that he hates me and my sisters i wouldn't say hate me but um kind of i'm a burden uh, being around um so and my views i needed him because after all i needed him he was the only person, and yes, he was the violator over here in this instant. But again, but he can fix it also. I mean, uh, he probably regrets it by now, but uh, but he'll understand me, and I, I need that soothing, uh, even though I couldn't make sense of it then. But uh, that's what I needed. So after probably three days, um, I did go to him, and I basically I cried. I, I cried to him, and I told him that uh, this is unacceptable. I don't even remember the words because the words probably didn't make sense. Um, and uh, yes, he apologized in a way that I really thought it really looked authentic. Um, and I was satisfied. <sighs> anyway, um, I, this happened so many times. This happened so many times. Um, I'm not going to say this violent. But it happened a lot of times. Almost every time this happened, I tried to do some damage. That was my kind of like the way to stop it. One time I made a hole in his uh, couch with my the heel of my shoe. Mm. I broke off his rearview mirror once in the car I while this was going on. And that's not the type of person I am. I don't break things. I don't. Uh, that was my defense because I was punching. It was always violent. It was, it was never most of the people that I know. And I'm going to pause right now for a second. Sure. I'm going to pause right now for a second. I'm telling a very graphic story and for the audience and people hear my story. And I want to remind again that my story is not my story, even though it's so graphic and so uh, crazy. Uh, because Especially for those survivors who are watching right now, that my story is not more. I don't deserve more compassion. Number one, I'm a survivor and Baruch Hashem, I'm helping others. Today's days. Um, the reason I'm here today is to share my story so people, especially such a graphic story, so people can grasp and understand what sexual abuse is. But the symptoms, the symptoms are those, and I have it time and time again, that survivors, they need to talk to someone besides of a therapist or before they even think of therapy, someone they can relate to. So you look for, and you usually don't find, you look for another survivor and because I'm out there, so that's why I made a name, a name for myself and total strangers call me and most of them are women. That's the most interesting part. There are girls and women, mostly women, mothers. Um, and it always starts the same way. I'm not sure if I'm a victim. I'm not sure because, you know, um, I was only touched. I was only overclothing. It only happened nine months, eight months mm -hmm. or something like that. The symptoms is exactly the same. It has it. Uh, it's not more because it was violent or not violent. And maybe in certain cases it is. But once someone is violated, 
when someone's violated, all the safety, all the boundaries, everything falls away and you can't make sense out of it. So I just wanted to throw it in there. No, I appreciate you know, that. If you so, want to expand on it later, but uh, yeah, yeah, I, I totally want to. But I, I do want to go back to to the events that you you just said that no matter what, you're always putting up a fight with him. So I was always putting up a fight with him. But you kept on, I guess, returning to him because he, I guess, he, there was a part of that relationship that he was consoling. That he he was your person to help you through the hard times that's right and it wasn't a hard time because it's not you know when anyone hears i lost my uh mother at a young age and even today in my 40s even today i'm a zayda <laughs> by the way hello yeah <laughs> <laughs> um even today when i meet someone from childhood or rather my father's age someone from israel or you know was in yeshiva what's your name your name is Taub. are you that Taub? Oh, you lost a mother. How old were you when you lost your mother? They feel so bad. I lost my mother. I didn't lose my mother. I lose. I lost my entire family, and I didn't lose them. That's the truth. I have them. I'm very, very close, very supportive. Of my entire family. I was kidnapped from my family. I was robbed away from my family. So those years, from the abuse, my abusive relationship was only in the year of fourteen and a half into fifteen and a half. But I was robbed of my family. Really until probably the 18 mm. or 19 and then it was a long long uh, heal, um, process into adulthood that i even uh, you know ptsd and other things and then in my 30s when i started healing but but it really that i didn't feel and i was always angry with my family that was um yeah a couple of years i was robbed from my family not only losing a mother so anyway, so back, so I needed that person, and the only person was him to soothe me. To um, he was the only um, the only family member that I really had. So yeah, I went back. Um, anyway, so uh, fast forward because this is the worst part of my story, and I want to come back to uh, this part. So I'm never sure before, after. Anyway, I'm jumping ahead. Um, anyway, in camp. And camp, uh, this also happened. I once, uh, it was in the kitchen. He took me into the kitchen. He was looking for food, whatever, for his family. The uh, same was, person? Uh, the same person, yeah, mm -hmm. middle of the night. Um, the, yeah, it was late at night. I, I in camp over there already. I didn't attend to him. And he, he must have been, I mean, looking back in hindsight, he must have protected me because I wasn't, I wasn't not even the not average kid. The caretaker over there, it's in Woodridge, and uh, private, I can tell anybody where it is. They can check it up. Um, the owner over there lives year round. Um, he's uh, from me, the Chabad guy. Um, he had uh, German Shepherd. And anyway, uh, anyway, so I spent a lot of time by him. The dog was kind of mine. It was a watchdog. It was, uh, nobody was able to touch the dog. But I used to make shows for the other Bukhram. Yeah. Uh, he uh, was uh, trained in Hebrew. So yeah. I used to run around with the dog in camp. In the Yeshiva Katana camp, uh, a lot of no-nos over there. I didn't attend Shurim, and I was never, um, um, I was never approached by any of the Nahula uh, regarding that. So he must have protected me, that uh, he's taking care of me or something, mm -hmm. you know. But back to the kitchen. Yeah. So back to the kitchen. So um, same thing. There was curfew, like any other Yeshiva, any other camp. You know, at night, ten thirty, eleven o'clock, eleven thirty, whenever it was. You know, lights out. Uh, you have to be in the bunk. And uh, sometimes I was not because I had to, because you know, tonight I'm going to sleep together with my friends. Uh, because my friends were my friends. I mean, my friends are strong, strong friendship. No matter which, uh, matter which stage I was in that year, I always had very uh, yeah friends. Uh, we were very good. Um, but I spent a lot of time outside, schmoozing with him outside, schmoozing with other adults outside, um, you know, running around with the dog. So one night in the kitchen also, uh, the kitchen wasn't a special story, just uh, the kind of how I always reacted, how I fought back. There was one time in the kitchen that uh, he also he pounced on me. And of course, I punched him and uh, we kicked around and there was a fire extinguisher in front of me. Looking back, maybe it was a call for help wish i was wishing that someone would get me out of the situation i really didn't want to go for help someone to take me out because then i will lose him mm. but i was kind of maybe subconsciously yelling out in total different ways that somebody should come save me i took the fire extinguisher didn't spray him i sprayed the entire kitchen the stoves and as long as the squeezes the three or four squeezes is i just went around Maybe tomorrow there's going to be an investigation. Who did it? 
I really don't know. There was once in a vacant bungalow, which was right next to his bungalow, um, um, that this happened. Um, why did I go in there? I, I can't even go back. <laughs> why? But I always fell with him. I always went back. Because, yeah, it was the grooming and the trust and the soothing, you know, everything. Um, he supported me with cigarettes. That was the biggest right. thing. You it, know? It's, you know, as I think as an adult and like understanding so much more about this now, it like probably looks so weird. But in the moment, it's probably so confusing of like one way you hate this guy, but another way you feel like you need him so much. So it, that two realities is so right. complicated. So, for example, in that vacant bungalow, I ripped down the the blinds from like three windows or four windows. Um, I always try to do damage that someone can maybe, you know, look, where the, where is this coming from? Anyway, uh, that's not the highlight of the story. It's just um, mm -hmm. how I acted out and how I always got away when I did. And every time I got away, I uh, ran away from him actually for a day. A camp was probably not more than a day, but in the city, it was usually two to three days every time. I didn't want to go back. I literally didn't. The first day, the first, the first, second day, maybe I wasn't going to go back to him no matter what. Um, but I always returned. I was alone. I was, I was very, very alone. I, I had no one. We'll be right back to my conversation with Penny. But first, let me tell you about OK Clarity. Unfortunately, you could hear the pain in Penny's voice. And if there's been a resource for him during his younger years, who knows what might have transpired. The rates of people grappling with mental health challenges or just overall unhappiness has been steadily doubling each and every year, which is so sad and concerning. But remember, you don't have to face these struggles alone. You can actually discover the support you need and deserve on okclarity.com. So whether you're seeking a therapist, a nutritionist, a coach, or maybe all the above, you'll find that special individual who will assist you in achieving the healthiest, happiest, and most healed version of you yourself all on okclarity.com. And it's entirely free to use. Each professional on okclarity.com is well-versed in working with the Jewish community, so they understand and respect our culture in every nuance of the word. So Shabbos, Shaduchim, and everything in between is understood. What I personally love about OK Clarity is the platform is so user-friendly and it's so easy to use. It makes finding the specific type of professional you're seeking remarkably simple. You can even complete a brief form and they'll suggest a suitable match for you. So you don't even have to make the choice. They offer a multitude of providers who accept insurance and you have the opportunity to watch an introductory video for each professional providing a glimpse into who they are before taking the very first step to reach out. Listen, I understand how daunting the first step can be, but believe me, it's immensely worthwhile. You'll thank me later. Recently, I was browsing their Instagram, because I go on there from time to time, and I love their content. It's fun, but it's also impactful. They regularly host Instagram live sessions, which is a lot of fun, featuring different experts discussing vital mental health and wellness topics, and they also answer community questions, anonymously, obviously, and also free to use. If you're not already following OK Clarity on Instagram, I highly recommend you go and check them out there. Lastly, if you're on WhatsApp, OK Clarity has an incredible WhatsApp status, boasting over 8.7 thousand avid followers, and yes, I am one of them, and their WhatsApp channel provides a cost-free means to enhance your mental health, offering not only valuable insights, but also injecting humor to make you smile, because that's what life's about. As a side note, if you are listening to this and you are a wellness professional and have yet to join okclarity.com, then consider this a friendly reminder that this platform is where you should be if you aim to remain relevant and effectively reach those who need your support and expertise. We'll include all these links to their website, to the WhatsApp, to the Instagram in the show notes. So click on those links. You won't regret it. Okclarity.com is here to change your life for the better. And now back to my conversation with Penny. Here we go. Is there a point where you where you said that's it? This is enough. Like I can't do this anymore. Or did it hap happen from like an outside force? Um, no. It um, actually there was a point. Um, but before I get to that point, I want to get to the worst part because this is something that uh, that um, almost all abusers, all victims, um, go through, and that's why the general population per se 
don't understand when a victim comes out years later or wherever, or even right away, you find out about a kid happens how long did it go on it went on for so long and went on uh, you know why didn't you tell anyone this is the biggest thing i mean especially someone like me who was violent or even if it's not violent if you aren't comfortable with it if it's a setting that's you that you're not comfortable if it's a teacher or be a stranger or someone from shul or wherever it is in an un, very uncomfortable uh um position or the abuse is very uncomfortable um, why didn't you tell anyone? So here's my story. And that's exactly the story of everyone. The details may be different, but the story is exactly the same with almost, almost every survivor, whether it's a family member who abused them or whether it's uh, someone else. So um, here we go. So in camp, there was another a chush of a chush of a person to describe who he is without giving his name. Uh, because those who know me from yeshiva probably can figure out who he is. Um, a chassidish, a chassidish yid, with a litvisha, really litvisha, he learned by Rav Moshe Feinstein for, uh, and it, uh, Shemesh, uh, Shemesh, I think it's called, I hope I'm not using the wrong word. Uh, he was Mishamash, Rav Moshe also, uh, tremendous Talmud Chochem, in a very, very from chazanish style, but chassidish warmth. Um, uh, anyway, so, uh, an unbelievable, he doesn't have to say, he's, he lives in a total different world. He has the smile of Rav Shmuel Kamenetsky, mm -hmm. and uh, he lives in a total, no driver's license. He has those me measured walk, the, the way he walks. But he loved the Bukhar. He saw in every Bukhar the biggest. For me, going back, I repeated it so many times, um, why I felt so violated by him. Also, because he was so loving to me. Um, he always, every time he passed me, or every time, uh, you have such a good head in camp. My best student, he always called call me my best student. Wait, I'm confused. You're talking about the original Rebbe? No, another Rebbe. I'm An talking about, there was uh, another Rebbe uh, that... Yeah, I'm talking about not abused. I, I, I want to get to... Got it, got it. You're saying there's another Rebbe who you're How describing as silenced. a very he charismatic, silenced very he, nice. si he silenced me oh. unintentionally, unintentionally. Oh, I mean, right now, previously, yes, I said it with anger. Mm -hmm. When I repeated the story, I'm, I'm not saying it with uh, this. I'll, I'll say it later. No, you're, you're sounding... I don't know how much time is left, but... Yeah, uh, yeah, we, I want to get to... We're running out of time. Yeah, we're running out of so, time. Okay, so, okay, so there's a very... So uh, this is this is the worst part of the story because this is really the worst part of every uh, every victim's uh, story. The abuse is one thing. The silencing after the abuse is much worse, no matter how horrific the abuse was. So this Rebbe called me one night to his bungalow and he started questioning me about my relationship with uh, this Rebbe. Um, of course, I, first I denied it and I was shocked. I mean, how does he know and how does he, maybe he's a fire extinguisher. I don't know. Hmm. It could be. Um, uh, anyway, um, later I suspected a different kid and I, uh, I spoke to him. I'm a good friend with him. He's a younger man, my age. Um, uh, yeah, he said, absolutely not. Uh, n not in a bad way. Uh, right now he would be the hero if it was him. But uh, no, he said, never, never knew anything. Anyway, so he questioned me about it. First I denied it. But then I saw that he, it's more than questioning me. He must more than suspect. I don't know if he really knows, but mm -hmm. uh, whatever. So I admitted to him. That, uh, yeah, we uh, had some kind of sexual relationship. I didn't say abuse. The abuse didn't even cross my mind. Um, anyway, the next day, uh, that was that night. Um, anyway, he was very warm to me. And he told me that, that, that don't worry. And I have to make sure that such a thing doesn't happen. And if it happens, you have to come to me right away. And I'll take care of it. And uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, it was a confusing uh, thing. But uh, anyway, uh, the next day, it was uh, more the evening. And when I was outside of camp with my abuser, uh, he pulled over in, uh, over the road, he pulled over uh, the car, grabbed me out of the car, and he threatened violence. If I don't go back right away to this uh, Rebbe, if I go back right away and recant my story. And I was like, whoa, I didn't tell anyone, and who knows? I mean, right now, looking back as an adult, he must have been approached. But anyway, first, I, uh, the same thing, I denied it. But uh, looking back, I mean, he was approached. There's no, no, right. no two ways about he it. He knew. So, um, um, so of course, I returned to camp and I went back to uh, the Rebbe. First, I started crying because right now I'm going to lie. So uh, I started crying and I told Wait, him. What I, did he threaten to do? Um, he threatened to kill. He actually used the word kill. I don't. I don't know. Maybe he would, but um, mm -hmm. I don't wow, know. Okay, he, that's scary. Uh, yeah, yeah. He uh, threatened. He pushed me. He grabbed me against the tree. He was. He was forceful with me. Um, 
so I went back to uh, this Rebbe and I uh, I basically started crying that I'm so sorry what I told you last night. It's not true. I had a run-in with this Rebbe and uh, that's why I told the story. I don't even know why. And I kind of blamed it a little bit on him that he put in the words in my mouth. He questioned me about sexual relationship. Um, uh, anyway, so uh, he gave me such a psak, in a very idle way, but he gave me such a musash mus that I didn't deserve. Um, Elushin Hara, Rechilis, he brought down all the Surah Elushin Hara, more than the Chavz Chaim, I mean, everything. Um, it, it was horrible. I left from there. That was the first time, no matter how confusing and how scary and how frightening any abuse, physical abuse was before. I mean, this was the most shocking moment I had in my life. Um, like right now, it's not only that I'm being abused and everything, but right now I'm, an, I'm a liar. Right now I'm a total, you know, whatever. Um, anyway, so I couldn't live with it. I couldn't make sense out of it. Anyway, so the next 24 hours was a total mess. Um, the next night, that's three nights in a row. So the next night I went back to this Rebbe, to this uh, uh, Rebbe, and I went back to him and I told him, I'm so, so sorry. And I cried again. I'm so, so sorry for making you crazy, for going back and forth, back and forth, because I felt a little safe right now. Right now, my abuser is already not in trouble anymore hmm. because it was only an accusation. So I felt more safe. So, And I knew this Rebbe would believe me. I mean, he was really uh, caring. So I told him that what I told you the first night is true. I did have a sexual, and I didn't say abused. I did not say abused. Did not even make it sound like abused um, for two reasons. Number one, it didn't make sense to me. This whole thing that was going on with me didn't make sense. And I never heard of it. And uh, number two, um, I really didn't want to get him into trouble. I still needed him. Uh, I needed my abuser. Um, anyway, he was much more forceful with me that night than the night before. When I told him it was a lie. In what way? Um, um, a lying, going back and forth. We can't believe such a crazy stuff. Maybe because there was zero awareness. Zero, zero awareness in those days. Mm. Um, I don't want to defend him because then I will defend a whole bunch of people. Mm. He's really totally out. He's not a social person. Mm. He's not in, he doesn't take care of Bukhram. He's not a, he's mashpi only in holiness. He's not mashpi on even Ashkuf on the street. He doesn't talk about these things. Mm. He was the most wrong person to approach me. I think the reason why it was him, because he was loving. I was a Yusim. I think they figured I'll open up to him. Um, I, I really don't know, but he was the most wrong guy to, um, to have this conversation. But anyway, so he was very, very um, um, forceful that um, going back and forth it doesn't make sense. This is too crazy to believe. And I have to stay away from this. This is Rahil, this is Mamash Moetzi Shemra. And this is uh, um, this guy can lose his livelihood, he can lose his pronunciation because he won't get a job anywhere else. Um, his marriage, his, it's my responsibility if his marriage goes uh, falls apart. Uh, anyway, so uh, during this conversation, I stopped crying. I actually stopped crying. I became, I turned numb. I was like steadfast. That's when I made the decision. I'm going off the derech. And I wasn't popular then. I didn't know how. I didn't have any friends on the street. And uh, I never externally, I never went. But uh, internally, th that's when I threw away everything because I, I didn't know what's Torah, what's not Torah, what's Yiddish guy, what's Hasidus. But uh, nothing, I didn't believe any, any anyone anymore. Anyway, so from there, um, camp continued. Uh, camp continued, it happened a couple of times and uh, whatever. Uh, after him, Toivim, he sent me to Israel uh, I, because I wasn't going to go back to yeshiva, any yeshiva. I wasn't going to go back. I came home from uh, camp. I told my father, I'm not returning. Can you talk about a 15-year-old boy? Uh, today, there's many boys on the street, but the, then there wasn't. Uh, Williamsburg, Clutch family, Shiduchim, there's hmm. so much, so hmm. much. Um, anyway, so he got me to yeshiva overseas. And uh, anyway, fast forward. Um, I have a lot to say, but uh, time is limited, very limited. So the the pitfalls from abuse. So this is a very graphic story, and I think I spent more time than I would have, should have. Um, the horror of abuse is not the abuse. The horror of abuse, that's a movie that you would like to see. But the horror of abuse is post-abuse, is post-trauma. Um, my life happens to be is a very happy life, even post-abuse. 
um, from the outside, nobody saw. Everybody saw, and I repeated it during speeches many times that nobody noticed. Nobody noticed. Now you have different lines. The way I say it, I did this and nobody noticed. I did that, nobody. Of course, everybody noticed that I'm not in yeshiva by, by, by the age of 16 and a half. I was on the street. Of course, everyone noticed this baby face, this 15, 16 year old who looks like um, 12, 13 smoking on the street everybody noticed everybody saw but they didn't notice meaning they didn't pay attention to it didn't ask questions didn't see what's going on why didn't you know didn't ask the why so anyway so i had a very good life um i found a job you know had good jobs i was very flexible i had a very good boss he allowed me to go uh to summer camp to work on a summer camp i was activity there director i was uh, the most uh, one of the most popular councils over there um, I got married at a very young age, 21. I got married, had a good life. I joined a volunteer organization and uh, I was very popular. I had a good job, a uh, very, very good job. But I was a total mess inside me. The post-trauma was killing me. Um, I can describe to you certain things, but I'm not going to go into details. But uh, just small things that, uh, you know, I, a certain time, it, it was always triggers, but sometimes a long time when I saw him. That was a trigger and I became violent. I lost myself. I beat him up a few times. Really? Yeah, it was once a wedding. I totally made a mess over there. But uh, yeah, he walked in just, uh, I was sitting very close to the door. Door opens up, hello, and he's here. I ran out and I beat up, I don't mm. know. Um, but there was a lot of triggers and I had anxiety attacks. I was taken into the hospital numerous, numerous times. And every time I was taken into the hospital, Atsula, the, yeah, the, the first Atsula members, they always called for medics. It was always signs of seizures and, and stroke or early, you know, uh, early aneurysm or something like that. It was always that type of uh, post-trauma seizure. Um, fainting, um, that type, and I was out after a couple of hours, and, and no one put one on one together. I didn't put one on one together, and I, every time I remember when I walked out of the hospital, I remember that this was leading into intrusive thoughts, thoughts that I couldn't go back, my past, or a story that broke and I couldn't get it out of my head because I related to it, or something like that. Um, I never, uh, never made sense. And that was up until the age of 20, uh, 32 or 33. I was suicidal for a couple of years, leading into my 30s. And uh, one Friday night, I was, um, uh, yep. I uh, actually, I wrote a suicide uh, note probably a year before. I had it on my computer. I sent out, the, I woke up, everything happened very quick and totally unconscious because I went to sleep and it was a horrible night the way I went to sleep. But I woke up with a violent dream, a particularly very violent dream. I don't remember any detail of it, but I remember it was very, very violent, which is not surprising. I used to have nightmares and sweats, the regular things. Um, but uh, yeah, it was Friday night. I pulled out my laptop, sent the note to a friend and uh, popped as much oxycodones that I had probably around 10 or 11 pills that I had in the bottle left. Um, and uh, washed down with uh, vodka. And uh, yeah, that was it. And I figured, you know, that's where I'm going. But I uh, wanted to say goodbye to my kids. So I, I, I was in the dining room, everyone was sleeping. And um, I got up and started um i started feeling the tingling and that kind there was no way i was going to get there and i became conscious again i guess and i realized what i'm doing was uh that's not the way so i called up my friend who's a paramedic in Atsula, and i called him up to come over i didn't tell him what but i told him you have to come over right away because there's not going to be a reason if you delay it anyway he rushed over he was very compassionate he reached out to another paramedic, so it was all done silently. I mean, he gave it over to the dispatcher, but uh, it was all done silently. Now, the senior paramedic, they came over and they took me into the hospital anyway. So that was that. But walking out of the hospital over there, um, after that uh, hospital stay, um, that was the last time. I was in the hospital, actually, uh, one more time later, but... Uh, but um, after that, I really decided that that's it. I'm a survivor from here. Hmm. 
Um, what, what 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 made that shift that like mental shift that you're like you're done I with guess that. that was my rock bottom and it was really rock bottom um because um maybe because I went to therapy right before that went to therapy for a very very short time and I felt that I'm healthy because um the way I went to therapy it's uh too short I can't explain but I was kind of pushed forced to go into therapy um, I was uh, literally forced to go for therapy because I gave my note. I gave it to uh, my dying at the time. At the time, who was my dying then? I gave dying? It to, yeah. At some point, what, what's uh, that, what's that mean? Like a, uh, a rough. A rough. Got it. Got it. Yeah, my rough. Um, why and how? I had a conversation, a little bit of an intimate conversation with him um, about life in general. I don't remember, and I blurbed it out. I always walked around with it because I was always hoping. I didn't have the guts to. Uh, commit suicide so i was hoping uh, i don't know that uh, you know a building will collapse right on top of me i'll have an accident i'll mm. have uh, something's gonna happen that note is gonna be it's gonna be found on me um i guess it was a very 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 low point and i gave it to him it's kind of not for help i wasn't i didn't feel that i you know that i um who can help me because i didn't believe in therapy therapy is only crazy people go to therapy mm. in my mind then uh, i'm a very big pusher of therapy only normal people go to therapy <laughs> um yeah if you're crazy you don't know the that you need a then little you need bit help it, right? yeah uh anyway so yeah i saw you know if uh, yeah therapy didn't even cross my mind so anyway i gave it to him kind of to put her responsibility in him because i don't know how i will leave very shortly and um and if he's not doing, I don't know what, but if he's not doing something about this, yeah, and I told him, I'm very angry about the community. I'm very angry about, you know, people are not protected. I was more aware. I was in my 30s. And I know about cases, about other cases. Um, you know, I know it's gone, gone. I didn't know the the magnitude of how much abuse is going on, but I knew that this is going on. This is something that has to be stopped. I mean, my life is not normal, and I'm sure other people are going through the same thing. Um so he pushed me into therapy. So, uh, so when I attempted to, okay, so after a couple of weeks, I felt healthy. Finally, I know why I'm having anxiety attacks. Finally, I know why, uh, whatever. Yeah, and everything makes sense and everything. You're only normal, you're only good. So I'm good. And uh, I felt healthy, and I, but I had that anger and that hate. And I had not hate, but the anger against the community. I became a healthy person. Then uh, a few sessions in therapy. Mm. And uh, but the community is still the same. No one is talking about it. No one is doing anything. There's no safety in the Khadaram in the schools and whatever. And actually, I thought everything is in the schools. So I saw everybody's being abused in the schools, which is a very small percent. Mm. It was too much going on, gone, but it was a very, very small percent. Most is within family. Um, uh, anyway, so maybe that's why I had that in me that already that I uh, yes, I need help and I am going to get the help and I'll stay there as long as uh, it takes. And I also had the drive then to turn into activism, to do something about it, to actually do something about it. And uh, yes, and I was blessed to have very good um, in the mental health field, in the rabbinic field, and not so much, unfortunately, Hasidish, uh, where I was, but uh, Litvish and modern Orthodox rabbis that I became very close with. Uh, yeah, I was invited to events. I spoke at events, and uh, the one thing led to another, led to another, led to another. So this was 2008. Uh, up until 2010, I never shared it with my, even though I was out there already, <clears throat> I never shared it with my family, because I still felt, and it was a very, very heavy burden on me. That was still hanging on me as much as therapy. And actually, my therapist uh, always told me, "Open up a conversation. You'll be surprised." And we'll see how it goes and we'll deal with it if it goes the wrong way. But I was steadfast, believe you're a Hasidish, you're whatever. I'm going to say I was abused. Oh boy, am I going to get it? You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were abused. Now you're coming out with a story and now you're going to kill, uh, you know, a father of uh, I don't know how, uh, how much, you know, you're going to give out a bad name. Mm. Uh, so I always held it back until I spoke at a very large event in Chicago. <clears throat> um, uh, yeah, so by that event, Anyway, so it was a very large event, a meaning very for the Chicago community. It was sponsored by all organizations, so there was no opposition, but all shuls normalized this, all chadorim and uh, whatever. 
um, presenting at the event was from Rabunim, Rab, uh, Rab uh, Gedalia, Dov Schwartz, Zatal from no, the Nusi of uh, RCA. Uh, that was uh, unbelievable to me. Um, he had Rabunim, he had law enforcement, uh, clinic, um, uh, doctors um, uh, speaking over there. Anyway, so a couple of weeks after the event, the, all the speeches were posted online. My speech was also, my story was posted online, and that's when it really hit me, because right now I'm public. My story is up out in the public, and uh, that's when it scared me. Now I'm going back to my community. You now, got like you majorly nervous that majorly everyone's going to know you, and now they it's, won't believe you. Uh, that's really the backlash that I'm going to get. Uh, A, not believe me, that I knew. I praised for the not being believed. But now I am a hater, and I never ever expressed hate. Mm. It's just the opposite. I, you know, it was always awareness and the problems in the community, and uh, it's never, uh, never hate. But I saw myself being received as a hater of the community, and as a uh, coming out with those another person coming out with a story. You know, life didn't go so well, and now you're, uh, you know. Uh, coming up with the story and blaming, blaming society. I was afraid of all these things and uh, with my family. But, Baruch Hashem, um, uh, two days, not two days, a day, uh, yeah, the following day, I woke up in the morning, I was very scared the first day, very, very scared. Um, and the following day, I woke up in the morning and uh, had a voicemail on my phone from my aunt, uh, Sassi Edelstein, uh, she lives in Monty. And it was a very, very hard, was the first time I was really hugged. Um, it was a very, very heartwarming uh, voicemail, a very long uh, message, probably as long as they allowed it in a minute or something. Mm. Um, anyway, from there, my sisters reached out to me. Uh, it got to them that, uh, you know, your brother's on YouTube, your brother's, uh, mm. you know, you have to go watch it, you have to go see it, and, and just the opposite. And uh, they were all we, like, you know, we never knew that about you, and uh, how you doing, and how did you, whatever, and it was, very 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 comforting and it should be a message to everyone it should be a message to everyone is just believe listen and embrace that doesn't mean sometimes when someone comes out right away with a story um you know you don't it's sometimes shocking because the abuser is always going to be if someone comes to you it's always going to be someone that you know also mm -hmm. just as you know the victim you know the abuser and the first reaction is can't be Mm -hmm. I know him very well, a big Balchesset, a big mm -hmm. powerful person, and it's not that type. As a victim, <laughs> first of all, as a victim, let me tell you, the reason I was so trusting, because he's not the type. Right. That's not the person who's doing it. Right. He's, like he's the, caring. The scary, evil yeah, person. Yeah, you not see the... an abuser, you see the this disheveled person. Mm -hmm. Those big glasses, I don't know, you right, know the right, Unabomber. Right. right. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, um, yeah, so uh, believe it. The first thing is, uh, you know something in the back of your mind? Don't believe it yet. Don't believe it yet. But belief, sooth, listen. When you listen, you'll be surprised and you'll find out something. But but the, the um, showing, and in, in especially for the compassionate people, because most likely if someone reaches out, they'll reach out to a compassionate person. Mm -hmm. So and it's a person who will really believe. But... Um, how do you react? How do you? You don't have to say something. You don't have to say anything. Don't say something stupid unless you are, you're in that field, not necessarily mental health, but in a school, and you know what to say. Mm -hmm. For example, one thing you should never, ever, ever say, and uh, God bless the person who did say it, tell it to me after my attempted suicide. Um, okay, I'm not gonna say where he's coming from. Okay. Uh, because I will identify him right away without saying a name. Uh, that person really was helping me and trying to give me the best help possible. Uh, he took me out for a supper three times. And I didn't need that. I made money. I mean, uh, he took me out like a child <laughs> of a supper to talk to me. And one thing he was pushing, he's a very caring person because there was no awareness then. Like, you have to take it. They when I was taken into the hospital, that was my rough, my dying. No one was talking about the abuse then. And a couple of weeks later, only a few people found out this, about the suicide. Only, only people found out when I told it publicly in 2010. Mm -hmm. 2008, there was only a very small circle that knew about the, my suicide. And I didn't say it's because of the abuse. Them, I didn't accept my mental health, except my therapist. I didn't tell anyone it's about the abuse. 
um, they were they were thinking the Sean Bice is really the Sean Bice. Mm. That's that's what they were thinking. So um, did that, your wife know about the suicide? Um, she found out later because I didn't even tell her. She didn't know. Wow. No, she didn't know. No, she she knew the next morning. Did she know? No, about, did she because know I didn't the... wake her up, and I when I saw it came, when I saw it came, mm -hmm. don't wake up my wife. And of course, she woke up. There was noise, radios, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the stretcher, the another stretcher, the the chair. Mm -hmm. I lived upstairs, um, or whatever. So there was a little uh, chaos going on over there. Um, she came out of the bedroom and uh, and. Say, go back, go back, and did I had she, a very good relationship with did her. Did she? Did she know about the sexual abuse? She knew about the sexual abuse, but I never spoke about it. Uh, yes, I mentioned it sometimes, or when something happened. If I was that not, it wasn't a shock for her? Like she married this great, wonderful guy, and then she hears um, yes, like, oh, "Yes, so wow, just... she didn't know how to process it, and mm -hmm. I didn't know how to process right. it, and we certainly didn't process it in a healthy way." Mm -hmm. So um, I cried myself to sleep many, many nights. And when I say cried, I sobbed in bed. Well, and she I can't can't tell like, you why. what's going and on? the reaction was always the same. What did I do now? Oh, why wow. are you giving me the silent treatment? And I cried even more. Mm. It has nothing to do with you. I couldn't express it. I couldn't express it. So that night was a very, very shocking to her also. It was uh, absolutely, because she didn't know why I was uh, taking out. Which is so sad because you feel like so invisible and by yourself and she feels so dejected and hate like and you're both just suffering and, and it, it's literally neither of you to blame here you know i i probably did discuss it but i don't think i ever stopped to that night that particular because right now you're no one stopped me with that with your wife no mm. one asked me it's funny why no one asked me where was your wife Friday night, when you attempted suicide, where was she in the picture? Mm. No one asked that. Uh, going back, it could be that was the disconnect, the safety that was taken away from me. Mm -hmm. I didn't trust her, which I always trusted her. But this was my secret. This was my life. It didn't belong to anyone. I, I can't answer you. Um, and next time I'm meeting a mental health professional, <laughs> I'm not in therapy right now. I will ask them what it could mean. Mm. Of course, they won't be able to answer me, but in a clinical, right. uh, yeah. So, oh, I wanted to say what yeah, the, the, never the, should right. be said. So that person told me I should work and he was focusing on my show and bias. Should work on my show and bias. You have to, what happened to you uh, 17 years ago then, uh, almost 20 years ago, uh, then, um, what happened so long ago, you have to get over it. Just walk away, move away. You're strong enough. You're, you're out there. You're, you know, you're strong to your friends. You have to be strong. Just focus on what's wrong. You know, focus on your show and bias. Focus on your show and bias. Um, and I was like, uh, I'm, I'm trying. This is what I'm trying to do. And I took him for, you know, it's very good advice, but I, this is what I'm trying to do. I can't. I can't. I was literally crying, and I took his advice as good advice. But right now, I know it's the most wrong thing. Get over it. No, you can't get over it. Mm. Person can get There's a lot. Yes, you can get over it. Sure, everyone can get over it. No question. But it's hard work. If you fall, there are some victims, Baruch Hashem, who are resilient, who are unbelievable. They take their experience right away from early on, from their teenage years. And they are asconim. They are just bulldozing because of their experience. It just builds them right away. But those who are my my peers and uh, you know are struggling, is uh, yeah, have some compassion, understand them, hold their hands, just listen to them. We'll be right back to my conversation with Penny. And what's following this sponsor read is maybe one of the most powerful moments in the entire episode. I need to tell you about a book that will transform your life. Well, maybe you're part of the Dafyomi group and you're every day part of it, or you're part of Kingdom Masechta and you're learning every day. Well, what about the Parsha? Are we learning the Parsha every single day? Uh, maybe a very little percentage of the Jewish world. Well, listen up, Jewish world. I have a great hack for you. It's called the Daily Aliyah. It's a book that covers every single aliyah in the Torah, and it splits it up day by day. So you're going to start off voracious. You're going to go through Rishon. On Sunday, it's going to give you insights into what's going on on the 
Rishon of Bereshis, and then Monday is Shani, Shlishi, etc. Every single day of the year, I guess besides like Pesach and Rosh Hashanah, but basically almost every single day of the year, you could follow along in the Sefer and go through the Parsha. How many of us could say we know the Parsha? So if you're watching this in the beginning of the year, what better way to start off the year by actually knowing the Parsha and also it's a great read. It's very interesting. It's insightful. And, you know, in the beginning of the reading of the, the Torah, it's very easy to know what's going on in Bereshus and Noah. But come on, let's be honest. When it comes to Vayikra, by Ravi, do you even know what is being said? Well, this gives you insights. And come on, we got to know the Torah. And this book breaks it down very, very well. So if you would like to order a book, you go to mosaicapress.com. That's M O S. A-I-C-A-P-R-E-S-S dot com. And you can search for Daily Aliyah by Rabbi Ressler. Incredible book. He's also He also wrote the, the Weekly Devar, which came out like 20 years ago, which is also awesome. And if you want, you could click in the link in the show notes to get this book. Whether you're watching this in the beginning of the year or you're watching this at the very end of the year, it doesn't make a difference. The Parsha is what shapes and molds our week. And whether you're a boy, you're a girl, a man or a lady, you will benefit from reading this book and I highly recommend it for you, for your family. It will change your life. Yeah, I go for one more note. The Daily Aliyah could be bought in any Jewish bookstore or also you could buy it online. Also, all proceeds from this book goes to daily giving. So you're helping thousands, hundreds of beautiful organizations. So here we go. Now, back to this week's episode. Did, did you ever confront the not the abuser Rebbe, the other Rebbe that that you kept on going back and forth with. This is a story I never shared. This happened probably before the age of uh, forty, my very late thirties. Um, yes, he was the most painful part of my story, only because I knew he was a mensch. Mm. He would not harm me even for a cover up. So he was the cover up, but I know. Um, I know he would not harm me. The, the intention was not to harm me, but I couldn't understand the tension. And I was very pained by that. Mm. Um, so when I was way into therapy, my therapist told me I wasn't ready. So at the end of therapy, I was in therapy a couple of years. Um, so at the end of therapy, I didn't even discuss it. That it didn't, uh, wasn't on my uh, list. So I didn't prepare for that, but I was very close to Rabonim clinicians and uh, whatever. So at a certain time, it started bugging me. I have to confront him and I have to hear back his story. What went on then and uh, what went, uh, whatever. Give him a chance to ask for forgiveness. I'll forgive him. I'll really, I went in very open-minded. Yeah. I will forgive him full of wholeheartedly. Everyone told me if I'm not under clinical, under medical care, I should not do it. I wasn't ready to go back, but I was, it was, I have to bring, this is going to be my closure because I don't see even today, I don't go back to my story and well, I still get triggered and that's okay. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not afraid um, every now and then, but I don't see it until my grave that I will ever forgive my abuser. Even if I do find it in my heart, I don't know if I'm allowed to forgive it for the suffering of my father, my siblings, my wife, and my kids. And yes, my wife and my kids. The suffering is not only the victim, it's the entire family. Um, years, for years later. Uh, anyway, so I needed to bring, bring closure with uh, this Rebbe. So everyone told me I shouldn't. So this took a couple of months. I tried to call him a couple of times. So every time I called him and when he picked up, he hung up. I didn't, I didn't have it. Mm. There was one particular time that that was the first time since 2008. And it must have been 2017 or 18. This, uh, when I finally got him. Um, it was the first time actually after that night. And it was the fourth or fifth time that I tried. And I couldn't do it. That the next day I woke up and I was like, I was faint and I had exactly the same anxiety attack. I was taken to the hospital. Also, after a couple of hours, I was taken in with a straw, literally an aneurysm. The members, I was giving fluids. So it, was, uh, wow. it was a major medical. And I was out in a couple of hours. Uh, everything, brain scans, a CAT scan, an MRI, everything and nothing. Not a shred of a health issue. Uh, anyway, 
So it was the night before Yom Kippur that year, uh, whenever that was, 17, 18. Um, it was the night before Yom Kippur, and it was just out of the... I prepared myself, yes, it, it, before I'm going to make it before Shun, I'm going to make it before Yom Kippur. Anyway, but that moment, it was around nine ish, the 9 o'clock hour at night, I decided now. I called him up, I have to meet you right now. The way he picked up the phone. Wow, my student, you know, whatever. Wow, well, what's the honor calling for so many years? Ago? I have to meet you. Sure, the greatest good. So I met him. And right away, okay, of course, it started with the loving and uh, I told him, okay, let's cut to the chase. So this is my life story. First, I told him what I've what I've been through, and I attempted suicide, and I almost lost my uh, my entire thing. And it all started that night. Now the whole year of the abuse, the later and the before. It started that night with that. Can you go back to that night? Um, and he tried to remember, and he literally started crying. He remembers. Now that I'm reminding him, he remembers something huge more than he can handle happened but he remember he doesn't remember the details at all and i believe him. he was he's authentic um even later a half hour later i even believed him more than those words but but he remembered even more that it was um, taken care of even quicker than it happened I guess he approached me was a buildup. I guess they were talking how, what, when, and who. Mm. She approached me. I guess that that took a week to me, only a night, but uh, maybe a week, whatever. So uh, yeah, so it ended, and he asked me for more details. What did he say? What? Uh, how did it go down? And what happened? So I gave him all all the details. He literally he was sobbing, and he hugged me. And he's not a hugger. <laughs> um, he and he asked me for it's not only the forgiveness. So it's not only forgiveness. What can I do for you? I have to do. I told him there's nothing you can do. I forgive you, and I felt it. Wow. Um, I, there's nothing you can do. He told me, no, I have an apartment. That's all I have. He has no money. He's a magachir. <clears throat> he has no money. He doesn't even have a car. He said, I, I have nothing, but I will sell my apartment. I will go schnorr. I will go. I have. To, there's no such a thing that you can't. You know, uh, you forgive me. I took away 20 years of your life while I had a job. I had my family. I married off one or two by then. I don't remember how many. Mm. And the saying, and I have many, whatever. I told him it's, it's Yom Kippur. It's going to be Yom Kippur and uh, move on. And uh, hopefully we can have a good relationship. That was a city block. <clears throat> I met him by this corner. My car was at the other corner. When I got to my car, I hear running behind me. He's running behind me and he's crying. He's crying. He's like, no, hmm. there's no such a thing. He's like, right now, I'm going into Yom Kippur. I didn't even know that someone has such a heavy heart on me. And he's being moichel. And I'm going to have the most beautiful Yom Kippur. You had a life. He went back to that. And he couldn't make peace with that. I have to give you something. He's like, he said, maybe, maybe can I cannot learn with you. This is something that I have at my disposal. Is there any time I'll give up my class. I'll find a new job. Is there any time? Yeah, I accepted it. That was actually my most precious moment. So that was uh, the story with this Rebbe, and I wholeheartedly forgive him. Wow. There's no two ways about it. I 100% believe him. I do not believe most of the time people say, if I would have known, or it wasn't exactly that. Even in my case, and most people I don't believe, there was more to it. The people who advised him, who guided him to talk, I don't know who was involved. Now, I'm, I don't think I'll ever go back to that. Mm -hmm. Who was involved? I don't know if I would believe other staff members. Um, I walk past that. I don't have a heavy heart right now against them, but uh, him, I truly, truly believe it. And uh, yeah. What's wild is that I guess the <clears throat> you mentioned before the most painful part of this entire experience was how invisible you felt, and when this Rebbe authentically was was showing how seen and how obviously resentful he was that that he dealt with you the way he he dealt with you it's like mamish the reverse of like the opposite of someone who's invisible like mamish like you are the only person you're the only thing he sees in this world right now and he couldn't like look past you it's very i guess just like whatever the opposite of nakama is of like wow like he, he mamish now he finally sees you 
Um, yes, yes, yes. And living with this invisibility, being invisible, it's more than a word. It's really in the sense, and I'm going to move beyond this rabbit, beyond the abuse. It's later in life, those who are struggling, and I'm not talking about the survivors, I'm talking about to those living with survivors or those who are, whether you're a mechanic, an educator, I beg the college teachers and the Husen teachers to pick it up, especially the college teachers. It's a time you can pick it up. Mm. If they didn't share anything, um, I don't know. I hope there's going to be a session with uh, mental health professionals and our about this. It's There's a lot of marriage problems. Unfortunately, I know a lot. Um, I know a lot what's going on, and intimacy is a major, major issue, and you can't pick it up by certain questions they ask mm. because the girls, they don't even realize it. That this is the problem. So anyway, the invisibility is, yes, so this color, or husn, beyond the life moves up in life and have struggles and have certain struggles and certain struggles to us con them those who are out there with all the awareness out there you have a sense already to see that there's an underlying and it's not always sexual abuse but there's an underlying issue there's something deeper than that and you don't take notice of it so for the people suffering yes it feels we feel very invisible i was walking around for at least I'm going to go for my 21, from my marriage. Not as a boy. Well, he's a, a rebel, you know. Hmm. But when I was married, I was a normal person. But I was I didn't do the normal things. I didn't always come to show. And when, if, when I did come, I came very, very late. And it was, was, in the beginning of your, like, were you in, like, truth actually from at that point or not really? So, um, yeah, I'll say it publicly because I think it's very important. And this is not something for my shidduch, uh, for my kids' shidduch uh, resume, but I mm-hmm. think it's very, very important because I have a lot of company with that. I was always chassidish. Um, yes, uh, during the weekdays, I have different type of shirts, but I was always chassidish, always wore a strimal. But I was no frim by any sense of the word. Wow. I didn't put on film since the 16th. Um, yes, I had a couple of times a year, I had my mother's yurtzat, I had a simcha or some other occasion. Sometimes it just, uh, from now on, I'm going to put on. And the last of for, for a day or two. Um, there was for a while, a Shabbos, I didn't keep Shabbos, only in public. So, hidden. Um, kosher, for a while, kosher was a very uh, short time. Um, uh, yes, no, I, I wasn't from. So, yes, when you see a boy, a girl, or a younger man, and the from Yingaman, let's say, let me go to from Yingaman. The boy or girl is obvious if you don't ask questions, if you're in a position. I don't, nobody should stop a car and you see a kid on the street, you know, stop, how can I help you? Don't right. do that, please. Right. <laughs> but those in position of uh, doing something is ask questions. Ask questions why. I always say, it's not my word, I can't remember from where, uh, whatever is uh, for a survivor, don't ask why. Ask what? What can I do now? You know, why it happened to me, why it happened, I, I, I asked it for a very long question. Everyone is asking why, why, why me and why this. Um, don't ask why, ask what. But for the person outside, the person in position, where you're a machanach, or you're a marriage counselor, or you're a, whether you're a family member, a rove especially, a rebetzin, is yes, you see someone is not towing the line, someone is doing things that's not typical, especially for their type. If it's a very laid back person becomes all of a sudden more more aggressive or more hyper, just the opposite, somebody who's with the ADHD all over the place all of a sudden becomes like uh, whatever. Yes, ask why. I mean, be smart about it, but uh, yeah, there's something there. And and yeah, in a person like us, is that's what I'm talking about, invisible. I'm walking around, I'm showing everyone, I'm showing the world, my entire citizenship family that I'm not from how can they see it? But there was enough signs mm-hmm. to see it, you know, coming into shul, you know, by, by line and uh, running out by Musaf. And in the 40 minutes that I was there, you know, I was only, I was being shushed the entire time. <laughs> right. You know, is uh, again, I, I don't want the shul to come over to, to the next young man. Not mm. me. To the next young man, why is the, why are you talking about that? No, that's not your job. But somebody, who, there are enough, enough occasions that even in my life. Mm-hmm. The, the parting words of Penny's 
take in this podcast is, is mind blowing and you'll, we'll get right back to that. But first I need to tell you about two more of my friends that you need to hear about and then we'll go right back to the episode. And thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk about the sponsors because they are the blood of this, this show that helps us run. So if you haven't yet seen me the past few weeks, I've been decking out Twillery. I'm wearing one of their like stretchy shirts right now. So comfortable. I was actually recommended by, I won't say which, but his name rhymes with Dessler, about their wonderful undershirts. Oh, Robbie Wrestler, don't kill me. The Twillery has wonderful undershirts that I actually didn't try. I was talking to him about it and he's saying how he's a big fan of the show. He's like, by the way, have you tried their undershirts? I said, no. I went online, I quickly ordered as many as I can. And he said their undershirts are unbelievable. Um, they're like this cool material as well. It goes on your skin, you put your tits over. It's amazing. So whether you're looking for an amazing, comfortable shirt that will last. Wait, why is it that price? Because it lasts. I've had my pants from Twillery, kid you not, for over five years. So go to Twillery.com, use the promo code INSPIRE for $18 off. And it's when you spend over $139, you gotta be a new customer. But go ahead and try Twillery. I rocked their suit for Rosh Hashanah and I was the most comfortable person in that shul. Their, their suit's amazing. I'm gonna try out their air suit soon. Check out all the products. They are the clothing company of the future. And now let me tell you why I did this episode. I did this episode because Dr. Shlemy Zimmerman said, Yaakov, you need to have someone on your show. We weren't sure if you should put them on That's an Issue or Inspiration for the Nation. And honestly, I, frankly, I left it up to Penny. Um, and, and I think it makes, it's very apropos why he's an Inspiration for the Nation because there's a story here. There's a story that you're hearing about the struggles and everything he went through. And I, and I think, what if he read Dr. Shlemy Zimmerman's book, From Boys to Men? What if his parents read that book? Who knows what a difference his life could have been? And it's so sad that there wasn't enough, you know, education about puberty and about stranger danger and about people that aren't strangers that are dangers and just going through life and developing and becoming a man. And and the book From Boys to Men by Dr. Shlemy Zimmerman goes through it and it's so integral for every parent of our generation to read that book. Yes, it's an uncomfortable conversation to have with our kids, but if we have the proper tools that Dr. Shlemy Zimmerman lays out in his book, you can succeed. Shlemy Zimmerman's book is basically helped out by wonderful sponsors. And basically, if you give an $18 donation to Living L'Chaim, you will get a book for free. So go to livinglechaim.com slash Dr. Z and you can order a book there. Please give us some time. We've had way more orders than we anticipated. And plus the person who's fulfilling the orders dropped out. So we had to find another person. Don't worry, if you were watching this, you're like, hey, I didn't get my book yet. You'll get your book. We're gonna make sure everyone gets their book, but we want more people to get the book. So go ahead and give an $18 donation to Living Lechaim. And then we can use that money to give even more books to more people. Now back to the finale of this episode. Okay, so but to make it clear, you obviously from now and- uh... I'm from now, Baruch Hashem, uh, Baruch Hashem. yeah. So I, something I saw because uh, you know we have each other's number now, and I see your status that that Ellie Stefanski played a very big role. Rather, Ellie Stefanski played a very big role in your your life. Yeah, yeah. Ellie Stefanski, I owe a tremendous amount of course. So tough for Ellie Stefanski for Reb Ellie Stefanski. Um, yeah, it's not. Um, it's he. Yeah, it's a very big part of my life because he came into my life um, at a very low point. Uh, I mentioned before that um, I still like any other survivor, any trauma survivor for, for in that case, we will get triggered. We'll get triggered. The accident survivor, you hear a crash, you know, a veteran, they hear a firecracker, uh, fireworks, you know, they think it's a bomb. They don't even think it's a bomb, but uh, it mm -hmm. brings you back a trigger. So I have triggers and I'm not afraid of triggers and, uh, you know, move on. Um, uh, last year, there was, uh, it's a year and a half probably, um, there was a crazy story uh, coming up from B'nai Barak, um with uh, one of the most popular authors, mm -hmm. uh, who was uh, probably not one of the most, in B'nai Barak, at least he was the most popular uh, therapist in B'nai Barak, who abused many, many victims. When that story broke, um, it literally broke me. In the first couple of weeks, actually, I was on adrenaline because I had so many, I had a flood of survivors who reached out to me for just for comfort, for consolation, for making sense out of it. And I was very, very strong. 
um, at that time, I was machazik everyone. Once the phone call stopped, like three, four weeks into it, into this scandal, um, once it stopped and I went back to my life, it hit me and I fell in. It wasn't a trigger. I fell into literally depression. The all I was thinking, I was trying to think about something else. I was trying to think of ice cream, of my work, of my family, of uh, whatever needs to go on. And I was thinking about the other victims. I was thinking about my past. I was like, intrusive thoughts, someone who didn't go through intrusive thoughts. Any case, if you have sometimes a financial loss or a marriage problem or sometimes a problem with a kid, you know, you go through certain days that, uh, you know, you can't get away from the crazy thought, from the doctor, the diagnosis or whatever it is, whatever that may be. To have that thought, and this is what post-trauma, post-trauma is, is not being able to let it go. I mean, this is constant, uh, constant, constant, constant. And it was 14 years that I didn't have it, for weeks and weeks and weeks. I came across, I don't know, WhatsApp status <laughs> or on one of the websites. Um, I came across a promo video of uh, Rebelli Stefanski's uh, Dafi Amishir, MDY, shout out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Free Gamara. Uh, yeah, free Gamara, yeah. And, my socks. <laughs> oh, yeah, your mom is wearing them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Rebelli Stefanski, I want socks. I never got socks. Please send me socks. <laughs> uh, anyway, so uh, literally, I would say maybe five sure. Why I even went to that? Uh, because I didn't learn. I was never studious even before my abuse, but I never attended a share. I wasn't looking for a share, and you couldn't even sell me a share. Hmm. I mean, someone would tell me, I think it would be good for you in this stage in life. You know, I have a very good fun share. I probably, uh, thank you, thank you, no thanks. Hmm. I'll go away for uh, whatever, but I, I did, I did try. I tried it um, first to blot, and then I signed up right, right, I signed up right away after the two blot. I didn't see it, uh, I didn't see holding on uh, to it. But I enjoyed it. I would say probably not more than six, between five and seven, let's say. Duff, so that means five and seven days. I was totally back. It wasn't a gradual, you know, getting better, only a couple of hours with intrusive thoughts, or, you know. It was totally like a light switch. Wow. Like I was back to myself, back to normal penny. And, uh, so yes, and th there's there's something to it to MDY. There's something to Rebelli, the Achdes, the camaraderie, the family vibe that's there, the merch. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's a, it's it's really cool what what he's doing with the, what the whole cover there is doing. He's making he's making it a matzav. He's making it so fun. And he's an equal. He's a, he's a, he's an equal opportunity offender. <laughs> He'll offend everyone. <laughs> yeah. No apology. Right. <laughs> He's he's got he's a fun time. And keep it up. <laughs> wow, wow. For example, I went out. He was in Tennersville, so I went to this year. I went up there. So I met him the first time since my speech. Of course, I got a thank you. Called me, which was very nice. He wow. was on the phone for almost an hour um, uh, after my speech in Kashanafshi. Uh, anyway, so I was there, he gave me a hug and then he jumped back. But a typical Rebelli, a, a, a woman, am I allowed to touch you? <laughs> like, uh, is it good? <laughs> good. <laughs> Somebody else shouldn't do it to a survivor, but, but Rebelli, I mean, <laughs> just keep it up, you. <laughs> he's a character. <laughs> yeah. He's a character. Wow, he's great. Wow, wow, that's really incredible. Um, I, I think we're, we're nearing towards the end. I, I honestly have like a million more questions, but I want this to be like an eight hour podcast. Mm -hmm. um, Someone who's who's on their journey to healing, why would you say it's important for them to, if if they feel comfortable, to be vocal about their experience? They may be scared of like, hey, the quote unquote backlash that I'm going to get from here or how people are going to judge me or my family. Like, why would you say that it's maybe important for people to be vocal? Uh, no, I am in the class actually who will say not to push a victim to go out there, to mm. go vocal, to um, to go public, meaning to say, not vocal, mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, to go public. I will not push, I have seen terrible, terrible um, experience. And that's not coming from backlash or the feedback that they got. It's- The reaction? It, 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 no, it's, it's uh, themselves. Right, right, it right. Takes, I mean, it they're takes, themselves, their own reaction to it. Their own, yeah, their mm. own reaction. I don't know why. I don't, I don't know exactly. I mean, I can imagine uh, why it's, it takes a toll. Mm -hmm. It's uh, very, very hard for those who can do it. For those who can do it, then you, every opportunity you have, mm -hmm. keep it up. Yes. And please call me. I mean, yeah. I just want to say thank you. I want to hug you. Wow. I want to get to meet you. Yeah, just keep it up. Someone who's not a survivor, 
but you're in the field, um, whether it's Asconis, whether it's mental health, um, uh, yeah, education. Uh, yeah, you try to do as many. There's a lot of uh, important in Yunam, but this is something that uh, it literally kills a person. And this is preventable. This is not cancer. It's not something that happened. It's not infertility. And please continue talking of every single subject. It doesn't minimize any one subject. Mm -hmm. The suffering also. I cannot say which suffering is more or less. But this is something by the hands of others. So it's the responsible of all of us mm. to be vocal about it. What I always say, it's also not my quote, is not everyone is at fault. There's only one or two people in every case mm -hmm. that are at fault, but all of us, whether you are involved or not, are responsible to bring a change to, uh, we're all responsible. It's very impactful. I wanna end off with this question. And, and of course, if there's anything that you feel like we should talk about that, that I didn't bring up, but I wanna end off with, Anyone who's listening now, and unfortunately, I'm sure there's a few or maybe even many that have been sexually abused or been taken advantage of that feel like they're in that such a dark place. They, they don't know what tomorrow is going to hold. They don't know how they're going to get out of it. What advice or words of chizek or strength could you give to them? Uh, first, uh, uh, words of chizik. I get the words of chizik. Um, more people that you think, and I'm not saying it as a motivational speaker, because I was there, and not as a teenager. I was there when I was a father of three. Um, I didn't believe that I'll be believed, and yes, we are turned into that way. The abuse did it to ourselves. Um, people will believe you. People want to help you reach out for help you can do it you were put into this position because you have the strength to do it um yes you can do it um uh, the advice that i would give uh the advice and yeah once you do it once you go through the healing and uh, the entire process uh, it's a wonderful feeling it's it's a really a wonderful feeling. I think I feel much better than somebody who had a happy life all their life. Wow. Maybe from the outside, I may not seem like those. There are some people who are full of life, but I have my before. I always talk about my before life and after life, mm. um, because there is after, and this is a, there's a special pleasure in that. That I am not the 22 year old Penny. Wow. Um, the advice that I'm going to give you is very very painful, and I was also there. Um, this is in almost so many cases. When you do have the strength to it, please gather the strength to reach out for help. The first phone call or the first person you approach, um, the first person you open up to is very, very hard. To do that move, especially for an adult, I'm not talking about a teenager, especially if you are you slept it for a very, very long time, you have already kids, you're a mother, and you're a, a good member in society. Um, it's very, very hard to open up. It's extremely, extremely pow powerful. You feel like, uh, um, uh, do it, do it. And then comes the frustrating part that many of us experience. Uh, for example, I'm a big uh, friend of Amudim. I have sent so many people and I think it's an unbelievable, great resource. But you can go, Relief is a great uh, resource yeah, and you can go nice. just to Asconum. It doesn't have to be an organization. Most of the time, don't worry, you don't have to go through. It's not a big, big deal. You get a therapist. But most of the time, the first guidance, besides Chizik, hopefully you find a person that you're close with, a responsible adult, whether it's a Robert Rebbitson or a family member that can give you comfort. You. But the reaching out for help, specifically for the help, most of the time, it will go exactly the same way. So here is the number for calling X, Y, and Z, whether it's a therapist or a clinical office, whether it's a group, whatever it is, you know, they'll tell you to call and that's where the frustration comes in. Because it takes a tremendous amount of strength and I totally get it because I was there. It takes a tremendous amount of strength to finally call up, let's say, a mudim. You finally, you reach out first to uh, to uh, to the receptionist. The receptionist gets a caseworker that calls you back. Finally, you reach out to the caseworker and you want, yes, we want the light switch that now I'm going to be helped. From tomorrow on, I'm going to have a good day. The caseworker tells me to reach out a clinician, a, a, a mental health professional. That's not what I call for. <laughs> I call you to help me. This is part of a process mm -hmm. and you have to go through it. You didn't create it. 
absolutely not but you have a responsibility to get out of it and it's beautiful once you're out of it and yes it's a long road and it may come with frustration the first therapist may not work out and usually the first two three that you're given probably don't have slots <laughs> don't have slots and it's very it turns off it, it turns off and it don't don't get lost try again mm -hmm. fight wow Penny, you are an inspiration for the nation. Thank you so much for coming here and sharing your story and, and the story of so many people that maybe, you know, don't, can't be in the chair that you're in now, but uh, speaking on their behalf and uh, educating us and uh, helping us understand. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for watching or listening to this week's episode. If you got this far on YouTube, I want you to give a message for Penny. The message for Penny is this, because he's going to be looking at the comments, is never give up. I want you to write that. I know sometimes I give you a one word or here it's a, a phrase, never give up. Or you could say Penny, never give up. Um, Penny is is an inspiration. He's an inspiration. I, I think life is filled with, with so many challenges. And sometimes you hear of others challenges, like someone like Penny and like, okay, I, I have challenges, but it doesn't compare to someone like him and what they're going through. So we, we found that this episode was an opportunity to really help educate people what is going on and and how dangerous it could be. Obviously, there's been a lot of work, at least in our community, to really help just mitigate instances like this. And uh, we're actually doing a full, full episode on That's an Issue talking about this subject with a ray of hope so that should be coming out in a week or two and i i thought it was very apropos to put this episode out right after yom kippur because obviously this episode is is around just forgiving someone oneself forgiving others for for the horror that they did and just uh being whole with 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 who you are and whole with life and it also i i wanted this to be aired right before sukkah because sukkah is is uh, Zman Sim Chasenu. It's the happiest time of the year. And you may look at this episode and say, wow, it's such a sad episode. It's, it's you know, Penny's life is, is so hard. But I, I think the message in this isn't to focus on the negative. The, fo the, the, the goal is to focus on the happiness, the good moments that we have, the, the light at the end of the tunnel. And I think that is where true happiness comes from. Nothing in life, I mean, you, you get pleasure very easily, but happiness comes through hard work. And obviously, Penny didn't ask to be put in the situation he's been put in, and, and likely you at home, going through the challenges that you're going through, you didn't ask to be in those challenges. But I think it's when we work through it, and when we try to get to that good space that we're actually achieving true happiness. If you enjoyed this episode, go ahead and support our sponsors. Go check out OKClarity, OKClarity.com. If you haven't yet, just take a look. I'm telling you, the first step is the hardest, but once you do it, you'll thank me. Go ahead and order Daily Aliyah. You could get it on in the links in below Mosaica's website. And also go ahead, go to livingwithchaim.com slash Dr. Z to order Dr. Z's book. We actually had a hiccup. A bunch of people who ordered didn't get the orders, but don't worry, we're on it. Everyone's going to get their order and we want as many people as possible to read that book. Also order Daily Aliyah and go ahead and get Twillery. Go, use code word INSPIRE for $18 off. It, oh my gosh, I, I am so comfortable wearing this shirt. I don't know. This is like how I'm showing comfortable. I don't know. Like it, it hugs me and it's cool and it's cool both in how it looks. And also I was talking about how it feels. If you enjoyed this episode, share it with someone that you think it will make an impact in their life. You never know what this kind of conversation could have. You know what? I, I think conversations with like, sometimes there's people in life. You're like, hey, are they being abused? Like you don't know. And it's, it's maybe hard to have a conversation with them about it. Um, which we all should, but maybe this is a good icebreaker to send in this kind of conversation and be like, oh, I thought this was interesting. Maybe you would also, maybe be a conversation starter. Until next time, have a Zman Simchasenu L'chaim. Living L'chaim.